Hello and welcome to another A Tippling Philosopher video and I am particularly excited tonight to be interviewing a, a scientist, a professor of physics, um, Dr, I presume Dr, I never know how to address people, uh, Tana Edis, um, <laughs> uh, and, and who is, uh, this is, I don't know, a bit of serendipity here, I've just been on holiday to Turkey for uh, 10 days uh, uh, where I've much to my relaxed chagrin have not experienced much tur turkish culture at all <laughs> sat by a pool for 10 days but um uh, my guest is a turkish american physicist and so there is a tenuous connection there and uh, as a as a little homage i am going to be drinking um as my tipple for a tippling philosopher some pomegranate turkish pomegranate tea so there okay. you go which, which um, I never drink. sorry which i never drink no, well, no, but you know, well, I was in a market and and they they thrust various teas in, in front okay. of me and and they were two that that I thought were suitably tasty, tasted just like um sort of uh, you know what we call cordial over here, which is uh, delightfully um tasty. Welcome, <laughs> welcome to the channel. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit to to the viewers who might not know you? Uh, okay, well, uh, you said most of it. I'm basically a physicist. I teach in a physics department. However, my interests, especially my research interests, have shifted. So over the last uh, 15, 20 years, I've largely been publishing in the history and philosophy of science rather than in straight physics. So I'm particularly interested in questions having to do with uh, science and fake science. Uh, really using uh, fake sciences as a way of probing what the nature of the real thing happens to be. Uh, and I'm also interested in science and religion issues. Mm. Uh, and one of the things I often do, uh, since my background is part Turkish, uh, when I was growing up, the religious environment around me was not Christian, it was more Muslim. And uh, therefore, I sometimes bring a more uh, Islamic perspective to some of these debates, which tend to be dominated too much by, I think, the Christian theological tradition. What, what, what do you mean by an Islamic perspective? I mean, how does it I mean, one of my questions I was going to ask you is how because we're going to talk a lot about science, right, mm -hmm. is, is how um, science in the context of Islam is different from science in the context of Christianity. So what would that perspective be for you that's different? I, the main difference uh, is not at the level of, say, the sorts of apologetic arguments that you encounter. Those are actually, in terms of content, it's very similar. I mean, say, for example, you have this famous American Protestant creationism to, to oppose evolution and so forth. You don't have as much of that in Europe, just a little bit. But you, the world's strongest creationist movements are actually Islamic. Uh, particularly based in Turkey and so forth. But in terms of content, denying evolution, there are only so many ways you can argue against evolution. And so they're very, very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference in uh, how science plays a role in an Islamic context uh, is really not so much the content, it really is the context. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, for much of the Islamic world, science has been a foreign import. Uh, the, in the Islamic case, uh, Muslim countries have been dominated for the past more than two centuries right now uh, by the need to catch up to a more technologically advanced Western civilization. So that catching up context really affects things a lot. So in, yeah. in, in some ways, when you're talking about, say, uh, types of skepticism about, say, religion that we're more familiar with in, say, Europe and the United States, uh, it does rely on a sort of a Christian cultural background in some ways. And it's almost developed as a kind of an internal heresy within mm -hmm. rather mainstream intellectual culture. But in the Islamic world, much of this came as an outside import, uh, particularly in the late 19th century uh, when Muslims were importing a lot of science with this sort of desperate need to catch up to a more technologically advanced West. Uh, with these imports came things like 19th century versions of materialism and so forth, which caused uh, very much of a 
religious reaction towards it. And so the history of science and religion in an Islamic context tends to be very different that way. And of course, you've got the you know famous arguments like the Kalam cosmological argument that has a, an Islamic heritage as well. Uh, just to throw that in there. Yeah. I mean, if you're talking about Craig's version of the, I mean, the famous Craig's version of the Kalam cosmological argument, that's more of a naming thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I wrote a book against that uh, many years back, which uh, I yeah, thought I enjoyed. But you, yeah. you really don't need to know much about, say, the Islamic philosophical tradition to True. make that on, say. True. Um, in fact, so, you know, you have a, a, a fine collection of books uh, yourself. Let's, um, oh, I haven't added it to the stream. Here we go. So your most recent book is, uh, let's read that out, is Weirdness, uh, that fake science, uh, what fake science and the paranormal tell us about the science of, uh, nature of science, which is what you were talking about just now with regard to, you know, the paranormal and fake science and being interested in the intersection with with real science. Uh, then we have the ghost of, in the universe, God in the light of modern science, science and non-belief, an illusion of harmony, science and religion in Islam, and why intelligent design fails. A scientific critique of the new creationism as well as islam evol evolving radicalism reformation and the uneasy relationship with the secular west so th there's a there's a lot there for people to get into and i advise people to go and you know check out some of uh, your books obviously um so it's difficult to know where to start really i i suppose um well let's start with you personally mm -hmm. um if you don't mind yeah, what, what was what was your journey into disbelief um, given that you you were born and brought up in Istanbul, am I right, in Turkey? Yes. Um, yes and w were you in a religious household? Was it secular? How how did the how did how did you discover sort of non-belief in science? I had no journey into non-belief to speak of. I grew up in a very secular household. Uh, my father was Turkish, mother's American, and uh, they both were very disinterested in religion. Religion was not part of the conversation one way or at all as I was growing up. Religion was always something other people did. And even say, for example, uh, the Turkish part of my family tends to be uh, non-observant secular Muslims with a few exceptions. So my interest in religion is in some ways hard to explain. It, it, it's more of an interest in, ooh, this is what other people are into. Well, I'm just going to come on to that. So, do you know, we, we often get interested in what we're not, right? I so when I, look, when I look at other people and say, oh, you're not like that, why is that? That interests me. So is there a case of like maybe growing up and seeing this around you but not being a part of that and thinking, okay, you know, because I know as a younger person you picked up a book on creationism, is that, am I right? And an uh, well, Islamic book on creationism, or uh, well, I mean, I you, I mean, you run into all sorts of things when you're a kid, of course. I mean, one of the things that I regularly ran into when I was a schoolboy in Turkey uh, was uh, there was a sort of classic type of Islamic apologetic at that time, which was a creationist and b uh, was full of all of these improbability arguments and various things of miracles of science in the Quran and everything like that. I mean, if you grew up in a Muslim country, it's almost impossible not to be exposed to that, whether it's in your family background or not. But for me, as I said, it I mean, the whole supernatural bit really didn't make much sense to me. Even, even as a kid, I would make trouble for myself around my friends. Basically, what the hell are you even talking about? So I... I guess that's a good time maybe to define some of these terms because people will understand them differently. How would you define... First of all, science, and then we'll move on to naturalism, supernaturalism, which is a tremendously difficult philosophical thing to do, actually, to define those terms. We kind of have an intuitive understanding of what sure. supernaturalism and naturalism are. But let, let's talk about science. How would you define science? Because I read a – God, I'm going to find out on my phone now. I read yesterday a really interesting uh, – what I thought was quite interesting – quote i think from tim minchin the comedian who said science is not a body of knowledge nor a system of belief it is just a term which describes humankind's incremental acquisition of understanding through observation science is awesome i don't know if you'd agree with that i mean what to you is science i partially agree i guess I, just about any definition of science you would propose to me my inclination would be to say okay that captures something but it also is going to leave out a lot. Science is one of those 
very complex enterprises, institutions with very fuzzy boundaries. Uh, so you probably, if you're trying to understand science, the, the way to start is with a few defining examples and then realize that you're going to move out into a lot of gray areas. Uh, I mean, I teach physics and physics is sort of a classic science. It's one of the most mature sciences we have out there. So uh, it's probably your best example if you want to start understanding what science is. Well, maybe something somewhat like physics. But then you start saying, OK, uh, is political science a science? Is computer science a science? You start running into things where if, if a discipline has science in its name, it's probably not very much a science. They're probably trying too hard somehow. Uh, it gets fuzzy. I, I, was re I was reading some arguments the other day uh, uh, about scientism, and I know that sometimes that's used as a pejorative, but the, mm -hmm. the, there are some people who would say that science is the only way to, to, to get knowledge. And, and the true scientismists, <laughs> if you like, w uh, would say that physics is, is, you know, out of physics, you get sort of biology and chemistry. So you're doing, you uh, yourself are doing like the proper science. Well, okay. I, I mean, I just meant... I didn't mean. Oh, no, to I was just no, no. I didn't mean that. Yeah, but like that's what some people because like I actually think that physics. If you're going to really be reductionist, then actually physics probably does underwrite biology and chemistry. Well, see, in some ways, yes, but that doesn't mean that if you want to understand biology, you need a physics education. You need a biology education. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, part of I'm I'm actually sort of reluctant in the kind of philosophy of science that I've developed to try and nail some sort of essential features of science in a lot because I don't really think there are any such things. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that there is any such thing as a preset scientific method that is always guaranteed to produce reliable knowledge, no matter independently of what the universe happens to be like, and so on and so forth. I, science, I think of it as our sort of very broad, uh, very Catholics in some ways, diverse effort to understand how the world works. So if there's any sort of unifying thread that I would be willing to point to in our sciences is that we're trying to understand how things work, mm -hmm. uh, trying to develop explanations. We poke, and, we poke and prod at the world in our various different ways, different methods, and we try and explain how the world responds. But this is, of course, an extremely general description. You are not going to be able to put something very general, even vague like that, intentionally vague like that, uh, it's very hard to put it to work to try and draw sharp boundaries between science and non-science. And in fact, I, the boundaries are not very sharp. Mm, I love what you say. I, I completely agree because I'm, um, I'm in philosophical terms, people will have heard me talk about this for regular viewers. I'm a conceptual nominalist, so I don't believe that there are objective, um, a platonic re realm out there where oh, yeah. like ideas exist. So like when you talk about essential ideas, this is essentialism. So I would I would deny that that, that science, for example, has these essential properties that we are somehow yeah, you I, know, discovering or accessing. It's, science is whatever we make it. And if we agree yeah. that that's what it is, then uh, for pragmatic purposes or whatever purposes, then that's what science is. Yeah. We, we have no argument with each other, right? Yeah, yeah, brilliant. No, good stuff. Um, so, okay, uh, uh, leaving science for a second and, and that, that kind of vague idea of what it is or isn't or could be, what, what do you, how would you, do, because we'll talk about this in a little bit with regard to particularly your latest book, I get, uh, I, I, would, I would have thought, uh, naturalism and supernaturalism. Okay, again, there too. I mean, you're familiar from the philosophical literature that actually drawing a sharp boundary there is, is very, very difficult. So my approach to that, again, is somewhat more pragmatic in that we have some notions of what certain supernatural entities might be in that there are common folk beliefs in things like vampires, ghosts, souls, gods, demons, and things like that. And so if you're going to talk about supernatural, we start with, well, what, what's going on with these entities? And we generally find that if you're looking for a common theme, there's a certain degree of, say, dualism between mind and matter. That tends, tends to be a common thread over there. Uh, there tends to be a way of attaching what are intuitively more uh, psychological properties, but disembodying them. And in some ways, uh, so supernaturalism tends to be more of a what I describe as a top-down way of describing the world, in that there's sort of mind-like things, or at least things that have more psychological properties and almost magical properties of, of, of affecting 
uh, matter even without any intermediary, giving shape to an otherwise dead and uninteresting lumps of matter from top down. And you find this in, on the one hand, you find it in ghost beliefs, but you also find it in things like intelligent design beliefs and so forth. So naturalism, if you want to contrast with that, would be more of a bottom-up approach, saying, hey, we start out with things that are fairly simple and uninteresting, subatomic particles, even if we don't necessarily understand exactly everything about them. And from that, you build up complexity, even, uh, we think, uh, including things that really excite us and seem very novel and different, like life and minds and things like that. So that's how I tend to approach things. It's not so much labels mm -hmm. of naturalism, supernaturalism as top down versus bottom up. Uh, so that interesting. So do, given again the context of your uh, latest book, Weirdness, do you, do you find so again just to remind people, Weirdness, what fake science and the paranormal tell us about the nature of science? Um, do you think there's a correlation between uh, people who believe in the supernatural and people who believe in the paranormal and are therefore edged to believe in like, you know, I don't know, maybe even conspiracies and weird, the weird and wonderful. Do you, do you think they're quite closely connected? Uh, in some ways, uh, there is, there actually been some research on this sort of thing. And generally it is found, uh, at least this is what psychologists tell me. I'm not, obviously an expert in the field, uh, but there does seem to be a correlation between the styles of thinking involved with, say, conspiracy ideation, uh, paranormal belief, uh, mm -hmm. some of the more traditional religious supernatural beliefs and so forth. Uh, there is a tendency uh, for people who favor more analytic ways of thinking to not favor such beliefs as much. But these correlations are rather weak. Yeah. Uh, so we are not talking about, I mean, somebody can be really your stereotype physics and mathy, uh, super analytic guy, but also be uh, very much into a very analytical style of theism or something like that. Yeah. You, you always have lots and lots of exceptions of these sorts of things. Yeah. So um, I remember seeing a paper once. Uh, there's a correlation between people with paranormal beliefs and people who believe in libertarian free will, which I thought was an interesting mm -hmm. you know, correlation. Yeah, so. Not too surprising. Yeah. 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 So, um, uh, so tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the, what you, what you've written about in your, in your last book, then in your, your latest book, Weirdest, what, 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 what was it that, that, that you were trying to uh, succeed in? in writing well, that? the excuse for writing the book was mainly because I, teach a seminar course, an interdisciplinary seminar called, course called Weird Science. I'm, I'm teaching it right now. Uh, and this is where I bring together third and fourth year students from all around campus, sit them in a room together and have them argue about ghosts, aliens, uh, the existence of the soul, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I find uh, that, uh, as I said, uh, looking at these weird claims at the fringes of science, uh, I think is a very good way of testing our ideas about what science is, what makes real science work properly. How does it fail in these cases? Uh, what are the differences? Uh, and very often these, I think, come down to institutionalized differences. So I've tended to focus on what makes institutions of science different than, say, for example, institutions uh, favoring uh, creationism and so forth. Uh, and uh, having a class that I teach about these sort of things uh, it gives me an interesting store of anecdotes I can use to illustrate what might be otherwise drier philosophical points and so forth. The, please furnish us with one, for example. Oh, well, okay. Here's one of my favorites. And of course, it made it to the book, too. Uh, we were uh, in a class one of these years where we were discussing uh, parapsychology and ghosts and occult things. Uh, and it turned out that one of my students came from a family who are spiritualists. That was their religious background. Uh, it's fairly unusual to find such people. Spiritualism is long past its heyday, but she actually grew up in a household where it was sort of regular to hold seances and things like that. Wow. And so she had all sorts of stories that she told about these sorts of things. But part of the what we did in the semester, one of the topics we were examining was uh, the whole creation evolution debate. 
and they all had to write a paper on this. So my spiritualist student turned in a paper and I first started reading this paper and it started talking about her childhood experiences with seances. So she talked about something like, say, for example, her uh, family, her father, for example, was in the U.S. Army and they were stationed in Italy at some point and they rented this house in Italy and they went down to the basement in a laundry room. Uh, they had a vision, a sort of a collective vision of Roman legionaries walking down. And according to my students, there used to be a Roman road uh, right underneath the building. And in fact, the phantoms that she saw, they were cut off at the knees and things like that. OK, very interesting. But what the hell does this have to do with creation evolution? And I started to worry that at, this, at some point I might have to sort of flunk the student because uh, what does this have to do with creation evolution? Finally, though, she got to the point. She said that one day uh, they got curious about the question of whether evolution is real. And in a spiritualist household, how do you actually answer a question like that? You summon the spirit of Charles Darwin. So they sat down, they had a seance, and they summoned the spirit of Charles Darwin. And Charles Darwin in the seance told them that evolution was right to a degree, in that evolution explained the part of the explained the history of the material part of the human, but also the account of biological evolution had to be supplemented by an account of spiritual evolution to uh, account for all of the spiritualist stuff. How lucky and, that Charles Darwin was summoned to say yeah. exactly what they previously believed. So this was the most interesting argument in favor of evolution that I have ever read, as in we summoned the spirit of Charles Darwin and from the other side, Charles Darwin confirmed that evolution was true, at least partially. That, that would qualify as weirdness. That yeah. is certainly true. Um, uh, so what, what do you think the, the, the culprits are for, you know, bad science being out there at, and okay, moving away from maybe the paranormal, but certainly, certainly the manipulation of bad science. Do you think, you know, religion, money, you know, what, 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 what enables, or what, why do these things persist? Why do these bad ideas persist? Uh, there are multiple explanations for this, and work on this is nowhere near complete. So part of what I'm going to tell you is going to be speculation as much as anything, mm. but. There is something known, especially by psychologists and certain uh, what you might call evolutionary cognitive scientists, about the substrate uh, that paranormal belief latches onto in normal human minds, uh, in that paranormal belief seems to be a human cultural universal. Just about everyone in the world believes in something paranormal. Uh, your sort of stereotype of a maybe scientific materialist is a very, 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 very small minority of the human population. So we have some idea about cognitive mechanisms that generate this type of belief and makes it very compelling to a normally functioning human brain. But that's only part of the story. Uh, because Does that to say it's evolutionarily adaptive, like? Uh, you know. there's a, actually, that's not clear in that sense. The, one of the big debates in the field right now is whether uh, paranormal and supernatural belief is adaptive or whether it's a byproduct of evolutionary features that uh, were selected for for entirely different reasons. Yeah, uh, so a yeah. bit like so what you're saying, the analogy would be a moth flying into a burning candle is, you know, right. the moth hasn't evolved to do that. Right. It's evolved to, to that's a by, that's a byproduct that's rather than an evolved feature. So that that argument has continued now for decades and uh, people who work in the field have their own pet views about it and it hasn't shifted that much. So it's, it's still one of those things that's not very well known. And it's, it's very hard to find evidence for something like this in uh, human evolution. All we have are a couple of skeletons and they're not going to tell us about brain structures. Yeah. So yeah. it's there's going to be a lot of speculation. But anyway, so, what, yeah, what, what I'm trying to point out, though, is that we have some idea about the psychological substrates of uh, supernatural paranormal beliefs, but there's more to it than that. Uh, it's not just a matter of normal human brains behaving like that under certain circumstances, uh, because a lot of the strongest paranormal beliefs we see around uh, are different uh, in this way. We probably always will have some degree of ghost belief in modern human societies, even if, say, science education was much better than it was today. I mean, it, it just comes too naturally to people for, for 
not to have a substantial minority of the population believe in ghosts. But then again, you look at some other paranormal beliefs and they're very ephemeral. Uh, so for example, UFO beliefs, alien beliefs have actually dropped drastically in the last decade or so compared to what it used to be like. Uh, and if you look at some of the paranormal beliefs that were floating around, say in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, some of them have entirely vanished. Like who today among my students would know about say biorhythms? Almost no one because it's vanished, it's gone. So there are certain persistent paranormal beliefs, certain paranormal beliefs that are almost sort of faddish come in for a couple of years and go away. And there are certain other beliefs that persist not so much because of uh, hijacking psychological mechanisms, that's part of the story, but because they have very strong institutional backing. Uh, so for example, if you're looking at creationism in the United States or in Muslim countries, your account for why that persists is not just going to be a matter of saying, oh, people more naturally are gravitate towards purposive intelligent design type of explanations. Yes, that's true, but creationism intelligent design is, is driven largely uh, by a religious subculture and the religious institutions that latch onto this sort of thing. So when you're trying to understand these type of weird beliefs that go against mainstream science, uh, you have to bring in almost all of our social sciences, starting from psychology, but then you find yourself talking about institutions and before you know it, uh, you're talking about even the political environment today uh, that favors conspiracy theories and all the misinformation that's floating around. So in that way, it's, it's kind of a fascinating subject for people from all sorts of backgrounds. I mean, I, I start out with, with the physics of things and I end up talking about politics at the end of the day. Well, it's interesting in uh, Carl Sagan's The Demon Haunted World, he talks about how, you know, it starts off by talking about UFO uh, phenomena and, you know, what explains why people you know would make these claims and then sort of connects it to well you know hundreds of years ago it wasn't ufos it was like demons and you know, angelic visions and whatnot and yeah. so you know the, the, there's there's this contextual environmental yeah. influence on on what people claim that they experience yeah that's very definitely true yeah yeah so um uh, well, so you've written quite a lot on ID and you, you co-edited a book on, you know, why intelligent design fails. Yes. Uh, so um, you've kind of mentioned that there's a connection between ID thinking, except it's more institutionally, um, you know, uh, supported uh, and promoted than, say, general paranormal thinking. Um Talk to us a little bit about uh, how, you know, why, why that's why intelligent design is a really, you know, big idea for you to try and, you know, get grapple with, you know, because I know obviously, it, as, you, as you mentioned in Islamic cultures, in create that kind of creationism, but although, I mean, in one of your books, I think you call it neo-creationism. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, you know, this idea that it's a new type of creationism. Do you want to talk to that a little bit? Sure. Uh, one thing I should note, first of all, is that, uh, again, the overall context for what you encounter in terms of anti-evolutionary ideas can be very different in, say, the industrialized Western nations and Muslim countries. Uh, and intelligent design is actually a fairly good example. Uh, when I co-edited the book, Why Intelligent Design Fails, I think that came out in something like, what, 2004? So it's been quite a while. And at that time, intelligent design was more of a new thing why it got why we called it neo-creationism and what is interesting is that since now we have about 18 years have passed since that book uh, we have seen a bit more of the development of intelligent design as a movement as the institution supporting it uh, and to a large degree it's fizzled out in the sense that it started out by big ambitions of affecting everything from science education to the practice of science. Uh, it started out with the ideas of saying that, hey, we have mathematical ways of detecting signatures of intelligent design. All of that failed, not just at an intellectual level, which is largely what our book was about. Uh, it, it's also failed to make much inroads into the institutions in the United States, especially, which would have been its main target. It's failed in the legal arena. It really has not been able to develop much and right now, intelligent design in the United States is kind of limited to a couple of places like the Discovery Institute in Seattle and so forth. And these are basically apologetics factories. 
they produce they they produce a steady stream of books and videos and everything like that saying hey the darwinists have it all wrong and all and so forth but by and large they have no effect on the mainstream practice of science at all and since they've been blocked legally they don't have much influence on science education largely those of us who do science can ignore intelligent design these days. Can, can you explain what you mean by blocked illegally? Uh, well, they had a famous court case, again, this is about uh, about a dozen years ago, uh, the Kitzmiller case, and basically they got nailed very badly. And that pretty much put pay to their ambitions of worming their way into standard science education. So... Because, uh, yeah, I mean, that's broadly answered one of my you know main areas of questioning which was going to be you know how has id advocacy changed over the years and and, and you very clearly said that it i mean do you think it's a dying thing or uh, as, as with all these beliefs is that there are going to be tenuous sort of believers it's, that hold on it's sort of continuing on but at a less ambitious level than they first made out when it was a new thing i uh, as I said, they, they keep producing a steady stream of apologetic materials, uh, but uh, As their, Kurt, so prospects, in, yeah, their prospects yeah. of success depend very much on uh, what effect they can have on conservative religious communities more than anything else, which was not their original ambition. So yes, you will have occasional creationism of one variety or other sneak in highly conservative christian american states but that's mm. always been the case before intelligent design hit the scene as well so in that sense it really uh it's ambitions of actually changing the landscape of the creation evolution debate it really has kind of failed that way yeah and i and i guess it's a bit like really well, in a sense which is keep trying keep trying keep trying and eventually you'll get somewhere uh, but uh, but but are these just blips in a in a larger trend towards yes. you know and some kind what, of better place what is particularly interesting to me is because i like to focus on institutions i think institutional features are what most usefully distinguish between real and fake science uh, it's nice to bring in a contrast between the sort of limbo the american versions of creationism has found themselves in uh, compared to the islamic versions of creationism uh, because institutionally, say, uh, the Turkish version of creationism has been far more successful. Turkish creationism has regularly appeared in uh, public school textbooks. Uh, you regularly have uh, university faculty, including in science departments in Turkish universities, denying the reality of evolution at some level. Uh, you regularly have in Turkish provincial universities, especially, they host uh, international creation conferences and have three days and parallel sessions and uh, all sorts of publications about their versions of intelligent design. Uh, so it's an interesting contrast. You've just given me a bit of a deja vu, I think, uh, because I have a feeling, I heard you talk about that probably a decade ago, listen to what was then my most favorite of all the podcasts out there, which is a Reasonable Doubts podcast. And I think you did a couple of uh, interviews. Yeah, I may have been on that, yeah. yeah. No, this yeah, has been on for a long while. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just remember you talking about that, I think. There was a, new, a couple of new things. For example, this business of the Turkish creation conferences is actually fairly new. It's only been going on since 2017. Right. Interesting. And 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 is is this just a case of, as you say, a, a kind of institutional push to try and, you know, use the power of the religion in in these countries to to push a to push a dogma, uh, you know, irrespective of 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 how well you can defend it rationally. This is just you know. Well, I mean, that's a good part of it. I mean, there are certainly very interesting political connections uh, because in in many ways, uh, many culture war topics, and certainly creation evolution is a prime culture war example. Uh, very often, these are proxy wars between uh, more sort of secular and more religiously oriented political forces. And the golden age of creationism in a country like Turkey has also been a time when Turkish secularism has collapsed and Islamists have been in power for decades right now. That's not a coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. You, it's, Turkey's a funny place because it's a secular country. Uh, you oh, know, really? 
well well it, historically speaking yeah. but 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 actually you've got Erdogan who is who is desperately trying to pe- appeal to I, I gather probably the more rural conservative Islamic types and then yeah you, the whole political scenario in, in Turkey is a fascinating uh, one to uh, to unpick uh, but you probably know an awful lot more than I do about that uh, but but do, do you see um, well Erdogan might be a good example uh, you know the appeal of i mean there is this conservative religiosity that exists and you see this in the states with the republican party the gop in terms of the rural states uh having a much greater um proportion of of conservative religious types you know there there is this uh wanting to to you know do a merry dance with with strongly religious types to 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 gain power and do you see things like id being being used as a pawn here maybe to you know to try and get into schools to appease those people i don't know partially i mean the the whole uh there's a very strong element of cultural defense in sort of weird notions anti-scientific notions that have close connections to do established religious communities and there's very much in most segments of what, what I would call the Christian right in the United States, there's something of a siege mentality and not entirely for bad reason. Uh, they're losing the culture wars. And in the United States, uh, we're finally catching up to Europe in certain ways. Uh, religion is in a state of decay in the United States mm-hmm. and everybody's noticing this right now. Uh, I can even notice in my classrooms. Uh, I, I've been teaching this weird science course for about 20 years right now. Uh, when I first started doing this in my first five years or so, uh, one of the hot topics was always the creation evolution debate. There were lots of creationist students, uh, and this was a live issue for them. They wanted to debate it in class. Uh, and many students would come from very conservative religious backgrounds. Uh, and it was something of an unusual thing uh, that I would, they would find out that I was not religious at all, and they would say, how these days is quite different. Uh, I we have a very similar student demographic in most respects, but among my students these days, religion has uh, almost collapsed in many ways. Uh, it is very unusual these days to have students not being religious. It's become much more unusual for a student to be very strongly conservatively Christian. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, in the topics I have them vote on. Uh, at the beginning of a semester, uh, for the last five years, not once have they chosen creation evolution as a live issue for them. Uh, really? So th- this is, I know it's only anecdotal, but this is certainly, you know, some kind of o- on the coal faced, you know, evidence of uh, a shift in, in yeah. you know, the beliefs there's of the a, people. In these there's a very definite demographic shift in the United States. The younger generation is far less religious than the older generations. And many conservative Christians are very seriously worried about this. They, they can see what's happening. It, it, re, really, their religion is in a state of decay. Yeah, that's what I often liken, you know, they, they shout louder and you think it's much more of a problem than it really is sure. because they're like a, a, a cage or they're like a, um, a wild animal that's been forced into a corner in, in the dying first throes they're, they're they're much more violent and much more kind of desperate mm-hmm. but but you know to in order to try and you know save themselves it, right. it seems that perhaps or at least that's what i hope in terms of say the religious right in america maybe um, but I, mean, I, I wouldn't be i mean necessarily over interpret what's going on either I'm, I'm i'm not saying that my students these days show up in class as people primed for being, I don't know, scientific skeptics or anything like that. It's just that they've lost interest in the older style of religiosity. And I think it's largely because uh, they've been eaten alive by individualistic consumerism more than anything else. That's interesting. Uh, so the whole, you said that, the whole community a, aspect of, of religion is not part of their lives. And th- so therefore it doesn't resonate with them. And so do you think that's a negative to losing some kind of collective religiosity is is this move towards a much more materialistic, and I don't mean that, I mean that in yeah. economic sense, much more materialistic it, it, individuals? It might, it might very well be uh, in the sense that 
uh, the current more younger generation who's uh, in the United States notoriously shifting towards non-belief, the nuns, so to say, uh, they're also very often criticized for being people who are rather narcissistic and disconnected from community. So it might be exactly that what we're looking at. Yeah. Yeah, no, I've often thought about that. And uh, that, that's certainly an interesting, um, interesting thing to think about. Uh, moving back to ID, uh, because I'm, I'm really interested. I don't know, as, as a phys physicist, I don't, obviously physics is a, is a vast domain. Uh, and you know, theoretical physics in or cosmology is very much di different from other areas. I don't know what, what what was your particular area of expertise in physics. Well, it's, my background is theoretical condensed matter physics, but it's been a long time since I've actually done any of it. As I said, for the last fifteen years at least, I've been more of a historian and philosopher of science. Yeah, interesting. Um, so, so going back to ID and the, the connection it has often to the fine tuning argument, I know you've got a chapter in your your uh, why intelligent design fails, and I think we've got on the on the live chat there. I think there's a someone's popped in who is an ID. Uh, he always pops in. He's a Christian. Always pops in and says you can't get folding proteins and so on and so forth. But but the, the talk about probability and and the idea that you know in abiogenesis, which is you know the start of life. Uh, you get this idea that it's ex extraordinarily improbable, so theorists would say. But of course, that would you'd have to know the frequency and and you know how often something would be attempted and how many yeah. times it's attempted to to have any idea of what what the probability would be. What what do you say to people who who theorists who would claim that yeah. that you know this universe is both fine tuned for life and that that life is also you know you just wouldn't get naturalistic abiogenesis. Well. My inclination is, I mean, okay, I'm not a chemist who can yeah. tell you something about this with acquaintance from working in the field, but my first inclination with an argument like that is that uh, the whole argument is illegitimate in the sense that you can't make a probabilistic argument until you actually have a fairly good understanding of what the probabilities are. And we don't understand the physical chemical background of what's going on over there to properly attach probabilities to these things at all. So it ends up, uh, I, I, I think it's, it's much more productive in this case to acknowledge that we really don't know what's going on. We can't say that it's improbable. And this is one of the things that I run into in physics and so forth as well. I mean, very often in physics, we run into fine tuning type of issues due to physical problems. And one of the most common examples is of course, cosmology. Uh, last semester I was teaching a cosmology class and uh, fine tuning appears in a number of contexts in physical cosmology. Probably the most familiar one to people outside of physics is going to be in the context of uh, say inflationary cosmology. Uh, and the idea there is, I mean, for example, let me very quickly explain it if you want. Uh, if you look at far, far away at any direction in the sky, uh, you can see for about uh, 13, 14 billion years into the past. And if you look at opposite points in the sky, these are places that are separated from each other by a distance that's larger than the size of that uh, a photon, uh, what light cannot travel between them in the amount of time they've been separated. So they're causally disconnected from one another. And, but also when we look at, make our observations of the sky, cosmic microwave background, for example, it's got the identical temperature, even in these regions that are causally disconnected. And knowing the physics, this gives you a real fine tuning question in the sense that we expect that there's some sort of physical mechanism that gives us some thermal equilibrium so that the properties very far, far away in the sky that are causally disconnected, why are they the same? Now that is a genuine fine tuning question because we know enough about the physics. We know we can, uh, we can present cosmological models that make enough sense that you can attach genuine probabilities to things. And then it starts looking very, very suspicious that just by coincidence, we should have the properties of the sky in causally disconnected regions match up so well with each other. So then of course you start looking for a physical mechanism beyond that. And that was one of the 
uh, main motivations for invention of inflationary scenarios. Now, what I'm trying to say over here is that fine tuning is not something that we are unaccustomed to in science. We run into this sort of thing in physics fairly regularly. We know situations where there is a genuine fine tuning issue where we have to address and cases where it's a matter of we don't know what's going on. We cannot legitimately attach probabilities in the first place. Uh, so in many cases, my impression is that when people try and make these anthropic arguments, when try to make these arguments for fine tuning to some sort of divine intervention, uh, they're picking up cases where we don't know enough to legitimately up, apply probabilities in the first place. And worse than that, what they are doing is that they're proposing a non-explanation. I mean, how does saying uh, it was the divine purpose to make things this way, how does that help me do physics at all? It, it's it's essentially an argument from incredulity, which is I don't understand how it could happen. Therefore, God, the whole God did it, of course. Yeah, and you that's know? what it boils down to. Because again, you're you're just sort of pointing out to something where you're so ignorant that you can't even legitimately attach probabilities, and then you say, oh, some divine power must be responsible. So it's hard, as, very, as, very as, seriously. And and this is the chap I was talking about. And you don't even need probabilities. Molecules left on their own disintegrate ribosome right, so, and the backbone of RNA and DNA disintegrates in 40 days, blah, blah, blah. There, there is also fine tuning in biochemistry. If you don't have the right watson crick hydrogen bonding strengths, you don't have the DNA ladder and no life. And it's the idea is like, I can't understand a particular way or I don't know a particular way that this works and therefore God. And it well, is yeah, just a very... Well, there too, the argument is that if you take nucleic acids, separate them from the usual uh, biological context and have them as just a bunch of molecules in the lab, yeah, they will disintegrate very quickly. But that tells you nothing about these things in a biological context. It no tells you nothing about their possible precursors in a context of abiogenesis. It tells you really nothing that's worth knowing about. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there, Otangelo. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, brilliant. Um, so what... what um, what, how if you, if you came across an intelligent design proponent, what would be the sort of first three things you'd say to them that that, you, that would put them in their place? What do you think are the three ways it fails the most? Okay, I, I have no idea whether this would put anyone in their place, <laughs> yeah. but my view of intelligent design is that when it first came out, it was interesting. Uh, I got interested in the whole intelligent design thing because of the claim that there was a mathematical signature that you could detect of design. If that had worked, it would have been a respectable idea, but it didn't work. I, I think that uh, the best answer to intelligent design is not dicking around with probability arguments and things like that. So the best answer to intelligent design is the biology that convinces biologists that evolution is the correct explanation of what we see out there. That is the reason we, in the sciences, do not accept intelligent design. It's, it's not probabilities, it's not prior, uh, it's not prior philosophical arguments, it's, the very strong evidence in favor of evolution and the fact that we can do so much with it in our everyday science. But then would they just pre present the unfalsifiable claim that then, then there's God behind that evolution? You know, it's well, guided. Yeah. I mean, people will make that claim. Uh, you just have to see, okay, are you just sort of slapping the label God on something as a kind of an empty claim? If it makes you feel better, go ahead with it. But again, let's not pretend that you're not, you're explaining anything that way. I mean, again, Absolutely. our interests here might diverge when we're talking amongst each other. My interest, if I'm putting my sort of scientist hat on, is, okay, I'm, I'm interested in poking at things and I'm trying to explain what happens. And if talking about some divine purpose doesn't help me do the job, I'm not going to use it. I, I think that's a really good point because, you know, the whole presenting God as an explanation for anything is the end of curiosity. It's like the end of scientific, uh, you know, curiosity and the desire to find, as you talked about earlier, explanations. Well, it, it may for or may not be the case, uh, but I, I mean, there, there are some contexts that I could see where uh, 
a theistic explanation might make sense. I mean, if you say, for example, we're able to take the scriptural stories that you have in the Bible and the Quran, if, if these were actual real history, if they were describing events and there were a pattern behind historical events that was best explained by the intervention of some sort of supernatural personality that did all of these miracles and so on and so forth, yes, then some sort of divine being might have a genuine explanatory role in a story like that. But we don't have that. And when you're talking about the physical sciences, you don't have a context where you have these actors with uh, psychological characteristics and purposes and so forth to make sense of the whole thing. So in some ways, trying to take supernatural agents with their psychological characteristics and inserting them into a physical science domain is a non-starter. It, it, it doesn't even latch onto anything where it can do any explanatory work. Uh, it, it just doesn't make the connection anymore. So if intelligent design people were serious about getting scientists to take these more seriously, they would have to do a lot more work to actually get that foothold saying this actually does explanatory work over here and does it in this and this ways. Without that, it just becomes uh, a sort of, okay, interesting story you're telling. Maybe it makes you feel religiously better, but it really doesn't do the job. Yeah, and uh, interesting, you talked about the Quran just then and in your book, uh, um, The Illusion of Harmony so, uh, mm -hmm. regarding Islam and science. Uh, you so often hear claims, particularly, and, and, and I guess one question is, why do you hear this slightly more from... Uh, Muslim apologists and Christian apologists that the the Quran predicts science or is more scientific or is you know at least harmonious but possibly more than that more more predictive than than Christian apologists do for the with the, with the Bible. There what is number, it about the Quran? Yeah, there are a number of reasons I can point to, and for any given institution or person, the weight of these are going to be different. But some of the main ones I've encountered are, one is the historical context of science being an import for many Muslims from the West. And that immediately puts Muslims, people who identify with Muslim civilization, on the defensive, trying to say that, oh, we're just as good as, as the West and even better maybe. And one way of saying that is to bang very, very hard on your scripture and say, hey, this is scientific. So sometimes you run into that. Uh, one other reason is that the role of the Quran, the importance of the Quran in Islam, is not parallel to the role of the Bible in Christianity. Uh, sometimes religious scholars make an argument that goes like uh, the analog of the Quran in Islam is not the Bible in Christianity, it's Jesus in Christianity. So Muslims are much more committed to the idea that Quran, the Quran is their central religious object, their object of devotion, and it is supposed to be purely unadulterated, untouched by humans, the word of God. While Christians have been able to move away other than a minority of uh, really fundamentalists yeah. uh, from this sort of literal interpretation of the Bible and everything like that. There's... The, the role of the the role that the Quran plays in religious devotion, in the, in the sense of sacredness that, that it has, is different, and so therefore the way that the uh, that Muslim apologists depend defend the Quran are going to be different than how Christians defend the Bible. I've I've written a, a number of things. In fact, I used to give a, a public talk on on Islam uh, and to do with you know analysis of the Quran uh, and to some extent the Hadith in terms of the in terms of violent, religious violence but in terms of the provenance being so important and that's what defines the difference between or that's what gives us the difference between Christianity and Islam where you've got 40,000 different denominations of Christianity that comes about precisely because you say of the ability of of Christians to say, well, it's the inspired word of God. It's not the exact word of God. And so therefore we can kind of change things and adapt them. And we can say that's not true. And this bit is true. And that's, that's allegory. And that's, that's literal or and just do what they like with it. Where uh, there's, um, if this is the immutable words of God uh, and in Arabic is the actual language of God, then there's far less wriggle room. And that leads to far more, 
you know, narrow interpretation or right. far less elbow room to be able to interpret the Quran. Yeah. And in it ways. makes much more sense in that particular context to say that the very word of God that you have in the Quran is a miracle and therefore reflects divine knowledge about the inner workings of the universe and is supposed to have all sorts of science and technology in it. So it's more of a natural fit that way. In fact, you find a few Christian parallels to say there are miracles, scientific miracles, anticipated in the Bible. You'll find this as part of the American creationist literature, but it's very few and very far in between. Nothing like the really massive effort that you have among Muslims to say that, that the Quran is almost uh, science all over the place. Well, what's, what are the couple of the biggest Islamic claims or you know, Muslim apologists would, would say of the Quran that, that say this well, is science? Well, almost you name it, it's all over the place. I mean, there are verses that are supposed to describe embryology. There are supposed to do, verses that are supposed to describe the hydrological cycle. Verses supposed to describe all sorts of astrophysics. Verses that are supposed to describe the Big Bang, the expanding universe. It really is almost you name it. And it, if you look at the actual verses that are supposed to mean these things, I mean, these people are interpretive geniuses. I mean, I don't know how the bloody hell they get, get it out of those verses that this is the expanding universe and everything like that, but hey. Fair enough. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you think? So going back towards, say, for example, Amer uh, the con American context for science, what, what do you think going forward are the biggest challenges for the scientific community and for, for, for science in general and scientists? Uh, well, there are a number of challenges that have to do with our current, what you might call information environment. Right. Uh, in that... Uh, Politically speaking, uh, the American science, scientific institutions have actually, public trust in them has eroded to a degree. Mm -hmm. uh, 50 years ago, it wouldn't have been, uh, you, you would have much more of a bipartisan support for science. Uh, these days, science has become much more associated with the sort of professional classes who tend to vote Democratic, while saying scientists say this doesn't cut much ice among a more sort of rural, more religious population. That's a serious problem. We've already seen it in the really pathetic uh, world's worst uh, pandemic response that we have in the United States. Uh, we see it in the prevalence in things like conservative Christian communities in the United States of not just things like creationism, but also things like global warming denial. Uh, there is a large segment of the American population in particular that has lost trust in science. That tends to these days associate science with these sort of point-headed liberal professors type of thing. How, how do you, what do you do about that? I mean, what, if, if you were, okay, if you were president of the U.S. and, you know, I think you should be, obviously. Oh, yeah. uh, or, uh, but uh, what, what, what would you, where would you start with trying to deal with this and and you're right. Like a, a basis is an information issue uh, as much as anything. How how would you try and deal with? This I don't know. Trust? I mean, yeah. really, this is a very difficult problem, and a lot of people have recently started thinking about it for obvious reasons with the pandemic and the global warming crisis and everything like that. But we don't have any good answers. I mean, uh, our first inclination, if you're like me and you spend uh, quite a lot of your time teaching science. Uh, physics to undergraduates like I do, your first inclination might be to say that we need better science education. But that's probably precisely the wrong answer. Uh, it's not a matter of science education. It's a matter of distrust in institutions that's out there. And distrust not just in science, but a lot of American institutions has eroded over the past couple of decades. And here's what makes life even more complicated. Uh, there's actually been good reason uh, for people, especially who are at a lower educational level than the professional class, to distrust institutions because they have been the ones that have gotten screwed over. And so there's a political uh, aspect to this that is very difficult to actually do something about. It's, it's quite interesting that you talk about trust in institutions there because the the recent UN like happiness report, basically well-being, it comes out every year, I think, mm -hmm. um, is, is fascinating because they look at loads of different things to, to try and calculate which country has, is the happiest or which country has the greatest well-being. And it generally ends up being one of the Nordic states. It was, right. I think, Denmark Denmark this year. But, but part of what they have 
going for them is is a much greater trust in public institutions than the government and actually they calculate that as part of the whole well-being sort of thing so you know it's really interesting that you, you, right. you do mention that and the united states is an interesting case in this regard in that maybe 50 years ago the level of public trust in the United States would have been closer to North European countries, a little bit lower, but still closer to North European countries. And in that time today, we've slid more to a level that's more comparable to Southern European countries, and indeed uh, certain Muslim countries like Turkey. It's not, not all that different in the United States anymore. Public trust has collapsed yeah. a lot of this. And and then you know you start looking at the the what causes the public collapse, and then it's like a lot of the media institutions that people do have trust in mm -hmm. are spreading disinformation, and so therefore you know I yeah. suppose one of the things that, that 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 you could look to try and combat this is something with you know media. Uh, and information but then you know the only place to go is some kind of regulation uh, which mm -hmm. of course americans don't really like generally which would be sort of regulating well, but, the media in terms of truth or in terms of facts yeah but it, i mean would it even work i mean here, here's an interesting thing i mean you you put the question to me in terms of what would i say to somebody from maybe a conservative religious background somebody who's a creationist and everything like that well, this is not a difficult circumstance for me to imagine. I live in the United States, in the Midwest, in a, a rural area. It's a small liberal arts college where I teach in. And so I have plenty of people I run into who come from a conservative religious background and who might uh, more often hear a creationist preacher than a science lecture. And it is very difficult for me to figure out what to say in circumstances like this, partially because I, it's not a matter of, hey, this guy is a science professor, they're going to believe what I say. Uh, I would have to work very basically in establishing a level of trust in what I'm saying in the first place. And I really am at something of a loss to do this in some, in some cases. With you, it's going to be a lot more difficult, a lot, lot easier, because uh, for you, uh, my teaching physics means something. So you're probably going to believe what I say to you uh, when I talk about, I don't know, cosmology like I did uh, 15 minutes ago. Uh, but with your random middle American churchgoer, uh, I have a much more, uh, much more of a hurdle to climb uh, to establish that basic trust in the first place. I mean, that's the, the kind of post-truth world that we keep hearing about that that we live in that people can pick and choose yeah. what they believe and and without seemingly needing any kind of rational basis for that belief it's just like i want to believe that therefore i will believe it and then i might if i'm lucky go and look for evidence for that belief afterwards yeah but it's a, it's, it's a bit more complicated than that because i mean it's, at least partially in some cases for some institutions uh, i can see where the distress is coming from i mean if, if you're say talking about mainstream media institutions uh, for many conservatives in the United States, uh, the sort of high prestige media institutions like, I don't know, the Washington Post, the, the New York Times and so forth are big name newspapers. Uh, conservatives don't trust them. And quite honestly, sometimes I can see why. Uh, I mean, after all, the New York Times was very instrumental in lying, straight out lying about things like the Iraq war and things like that. I've lost a lot of my trust in media institutions, so I'm, I'm not going to tell them, believe everything you're going to read in the New York Times. If you read anything about, about foreign news like that in the New York Times, you're probably going to have a large dose of propaganda mixed in there, and it's very hard to tell apart which is which. Or if you're talking about, say, uh, expert recommendations, talking heads on TV and everything like that. Well, uh, the United States has, since the... Uh, economic, uh, the financial collapse of 2008 and so forth, there's a, lots of economic stagnation going on. And so what do I tell people? To trust the econ economists and everything like that? I don't trust the economists. So there's a lot of institutions where it's, it's not just a matter of saying, wringing our hands and saying, oh, no, people don't trust people with PhD after their name anymore. I think we also have to sit back and say, well, a lot of we PhDs have actually screwed up in the first place, and uh, we have to do something to earn the trust of the public back, because we haven't always done a very good job. Your picture has frozen. Have I lost you? I seem to have lost you.
Sorry, I'm back. Are you there? Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I was just sorry. Wondering. I did. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. I'm having a bit of internet issue tonight, so I do massively I apologize about that. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, I, I guess where we were at, I don't know. You were just about to say something, I think, quite key there, but uh, I have no idea what it oh, was. It, I mean, my basic point is that uh, sometimes I see uh, those of us who are experts in certain subjects, those of us with PhD, those of us who call ourselves skeptics and so forth, we we are often fairly quick to sort of bemoan the fact that, hey, people don't trust scientists anymore. Uh, but I don't think this is entirely a one-sided issue. I think we have to do some more work to earn public trust. Uh, it's, it, sometimes we have screwed up. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I was going to say. That, that it seems that you're advocating that long journey of building up trust. Yeah. You know, which is which is very difficult when you're talking about you know a large newspaper. Uh, the where people are biased by when people go wrong and that, you know, things go wrong and they don't forget that very easily. They don't forgive that very easily. And so, yeah, these, these things are difficult. If anyone has any uh, super chats or questions, please get them in uh, for our esteemed guest. Um, so uh, if you were, so you've just written um, your, your latest book, Weirdness. Uh, is, is there anything else you want to say about that book? For First of all, um, well, I mean, yeah, obviously, I hope people will read it and enjoy it. You probably need a fairly dark sense of humor for it. Why is that? It... I... Sometimes I like to tell uh, stories that lead to a point. And between each chapter, that's more sort of a more substantive argument. I have sort of little sort of fictional stories. They're essentially exercises in dark humor. Good, 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 good. Well, I think, you know, I think when delivering any kind of, uh, you know, points, uh, I try and I try and inject some humor into my books, particularly the more popular ones. I think it's, it's super important. Um, so uh, what what is where would you want to look now in terms of any writing projects? Are there anything, any areas that are particularly of interest? Is there something you think you, st you still need to, to well, sort my, of write about and talk about? My current writing project is I've started on something which uh, is hopefully going to become one of the Cambridge University Press Element series, a short book, and it's uh, on the subject of uh, Islam and science. And right. I'm, I'm going to try and draw a broad brush picture uh, and uh, make the argument that in some ways the whole science and religion debate is irresolvable because people who participate in the debate bring uh, different and conflicting purposes to the job and try to explore a little bit of that. So you, you've talked a lot about uh, being interested in the history and philosophy of science. How, how far back have you, have you looked into the history of science? What, what is it, what's your main sort of era of interest in that? Okay, is that in, mo modern history or right. in, in the, the work that I have done, that people have characterized in the history of science largely concerns uh, things like the recent history of Islamic creationism. And obviously that's not gonna go back to the 17th century, it really yeah. is you find some precursors in the 19th century, but it's mostly 20th and even late 20th century stuff. Because one of the most, uh, I only ask because one of the things that really irritates me is when particularly Christians will, will claim that, uh, you know, science could only have happened with Christianity or Christianity is is like the bedrock of science and, and the scientific method. And I hear this so often and it just really irritates me because, you know, Christianity was a default religion and everyone was Christian and there are all sorts of problems with that approach. Yeah. I doubt it, but even if historically that was correct, that wouldn't necessarily mean much in an apologetic context. Uh, maybe it could be that uh, the kind of historical accidents that led to modern science happened to line up in Western Latin Christendom. But then much of the world has adopted this, and these days science has done perfectly well in India and China and so on and so forth, without a Christian cultural background. So just because there may be some uh, Christian influence in, say, the uh, medieval precursors to what became science, doesn't necessarily mean that Christianity is sort of an essential part of science. It isn't. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, and it, it's just you know, there's so so many issues. I, I remember writing articles on that many years back, and just but it's so so pervasive. It's just I don't. Yeah. Anyway, that's a bugbear of mine. Um, sorry, you're going to say something. Well, no, I mean that's actually an interesting observation because this is something I see among Muslim apologists as well as Christian. Is that on the one hand, there's this tendency to say, uh, "Oh, uh, science uh, cannot really touch our faith and everything like that," but on the other hand, there's almost a sort of desperate thing to seek validation from science as well. Yes. So the psychology there is kind of interesting in some ways. Yeah, having your cake and eating it as well, you yeah. know, it's it, it, it's really common. Yeah, yeah, it's science. It's, you know, be aware of that and don't send your children to university and all this kind of stuff because mm -hmm. you know rationality will get them and blah blah blah. And then, and on the other hand, science and rationality. Look at how rational and scientific our, our religion is. And it's uh, yeah, yeah. Heads you win, tails. Heads you win. Tails, I lose. Yep, that's right. Um, or the other way around. Um, so uh, going back to your weirdness book, is is there um, any kind of paranormal uh, beliefs that are, are are particularly bizarre that you look at in, in that book? That that are uh... oh well, weirdness is not so much a book about examining in detail various paranormal claims. Uh, in fact, I pretty much take it for granted that these weird claims are wrong. Uh, but I want to use those as a way, a device to probe the nature of real science. Uh, so much of the book really is not so much about the weird beliefs, is about, okay, let's take this, take it for granted that it's weird. This is why it's weird. What does that mean for real science? So that's largely the questions I'm trying to address. And uh, have you... Have you ever had, because uh, uh, one of your um, anecdotes you, you gave earlier of, of, of some of your students, it sort of made me wonder if you've had students that have had a weird belief in one context, say, for example, a particular re religious belief, and then, you know, through you know, learning with you or whatever, some kind of process involved with your teaching, ha has, has seen that this other thing is completely ri ridiculous. Have they ever kind of joined the dots uh, and then, and then led to them questioning uh, another cherished belief on on the basis. Yes, of... uh, I would not necessarily attribute that to taking my weird science course. It's probably just one factor among many. Uh, but yeah, I have had students who sometimes have come back to me years later saying, "Oh, actually, I've changed my mind about this, that, and the other too." Uh, one of the most prominent examples is uh, I had a student who was very much into supporting intelligent design. I and he used uh, his uh, papers that he wrote in the weird science course for supporting rear si supporting intelligent design and everything like that, which is perfectly fine with me. I, I, I don't care if students defend anything that they want as long as they do a good job of it. Uh, and he, w he came from a very conservative Christian background. And when he graduated from college, after having taken my weird science course too and everything like that, he was still very much a conservative Christian, uh, anti-evolutionary and everything like that. And about a decade later, I got an email from him saying that his thinking about these matters had changed so much that not only had he come to sort of see that evolution was correct, uh, but he really did not consider himself really even much of a Christian anymore. So, yeah, people change. But usually that's because of a whole confluence of different factors. Any sort of thing you learn in one sort of course is just one part of it. If I had a student who had the exact opposite effect, that they, I don't know, converted to found religion five years later, uh, that I wouldn't have heard from them. They wouldn't have emailed me. So who knows? Yeah. True. Maybe, maybe I'm driving students away from skepticism on average. I wouldn't know. So um, uh, Paul Schlachter says, if you zoom out like, I, like aliens watching us from space, what would be the weirdest trait of human beings? Well, I know it's not may not necessarily be in your sort of wheelhouse here, but oh yeah, anybody who answers this is going to engage in large amounts of speculation. Yeah, but I can yeah. speculate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, aliens watching us from space. What would we do? Weird... What's a, what's a weird trait that humans have psychologically or in terms of what we believe that you go? I can't believe we believe that or we do that. Uh, I think in some ways. I don't know if an alien would observe this as well, but we seem to be just smart enough to be stupid. <laughs> well, what do you mean by that? Uh, we're smart to understand a lot of things about the universe, but 
also in our behavior, in our uh, politics, in our various ways, give every indication that we don't actually understand what's going on. And global warming is a very prominent example. We've known for decades right now that we're in serious deep trouble, and we are determined not to do anything about it. I mean, I've almost given up. We're screwed. Yeah, yeah, uh, it is. Yeah, it's it's it seems to be. You know, uh, it's great that Biden's just passed one of the biggest. But then again, he's only passed it on the reconciliation, which is a fifty-fifty you know, Senate split, where where you know the VP has had to to make the casting vote. But you know, there's hopefully a good bit of funding into tackling uh, climate change, as far as the U.S. is concerned. But yeah, it's so little, so late, and frustrating that 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 science is being routinely ignored because uh, people can misrepresent science in these in these positions of power and positions of media power. You know, and people bring in snowballs into the Senate and saying, "Well, look, you know, that's just." Look, this is climate change is not happening. No, that's that's weather. That's, that's not climate. Come on. Uh, so, I mean, is, is that do you do you talk in in weirdness, for example? Uh, do you talk about climate change in that book as as far as you know fake science and trying to oh, tackle? Yes, it's, it's one of the topics I mention. Again, not the detailed science of climate change. I pretty much take it for granted that uh, the scientists. And I've worked a little bit with climate, climate science myself in the past that I, I pretty much assume that we've got it right. Uh, but the interesting question raised from that is uh, it doesn't stop over there. As an institution in the sciences, we seem to be fairly powerless in getting people to actually respond to what we think is going on. And that leads into all sorts of interesting questions about uh, science's role in the public in the political arena and all such questions. Which and, the recent Netflix film Don't Look Up sort of parodied and, and I yeah, don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, which no, is, you know, which is exactly what you're talking about there, which is the inability for people to take on board scientific advice and and for science to be almost impotently sitting at the side yeah. as as a kind of institutional um you know network. Um but again, you know, the question remains is what can you do about that? And and I guess, you know, that the complexity of the solution is 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 almost, you know, beyond us. I really don't know. I this is one of one of the stories I tell in the book is uh, there was a time maybe about a dozen or thirteen years ago or so when I actually went to Washington D.C. as part of a scientific delegation associated with the Union of Concerned Scientists. To lobby Congress at that time, there was a climate bill under consideration. And so for a couple of days, we went around in teams of three people. One, a scientist that has something to do with climate, two, an economist to tell the Congress critters that this is not going to tank the economy after all, and see somebody who knew a bit about the whole lobbying aspect of things. And I spent, well, maybe two or three days in Washington going and talking to congressional staffers and so on and so forth. It was one of the most discouraging experiences of my life. It's you really learned doing that that they're not going to do anything. Wow, and that's the power of money. I mean, or yeah. lobbying. You know, lobbying at the end of the day is is political corruption, legalized corruption. Yeah. I, I don't understand how America. I do understand because it's money, right? But it's why, I, although we have lobbying in, in the UK, it's a lot more tightly regulated as far as I can work out. In America, it's just like, yeah, you can get paid what you like and it's not a problem. And, and they like quid pro quo. You know, surely if someone's going to pay you a lot of money, they're going to want something in return, right? So the NRA paying all GOP politicians like a shed load of money every year, they're going to want something back, right? Presumably. Uh, and that there is uh, uh, is uh, corruption. Um, uh, well, look, if anyone has any final questions before we um, sort of start wrapping things up, please get them in uh, sweet, um, and that would be fantastic. Uh, are, are there any other sort of uh, topics or areas you you want to um, mention that we haven't yet sort of touched upon? Is that a question to me or the audience? 
Uh, for, uh, for yourself, is it is it is there anything that, that that's burning um, in, in your mind as far as uh, science is concerned at the moment? Hmm. Hard to say there's anything that's burning in my mind because what's burning in my mind is probably what I need to tell my physics students tomorrow in well the next physics lecture. But I guess one thing that uh, I might want to say is that. Uh, we should do perhaps a better job, those of us who are skeptical of religious and paranormal claims, uh, maybe we need to do a bit of a better job in appreciating science as a very human institution. Uh, we sometimes get into the habit of idealizing science, and sometimes for good reason. I mean, we get a lot of things right doing science. It's fairly impressive that these basic, uh, intelligent enough to be stupid apes that we can understand a, such a lot of what's going on in the universe. This is impressive, no doubt. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, science is also a fairly large uh, institution that has an important role in modern economies. And science also, because of this, has its own little corruptions and things like that. You don't want to idealize science to such a degree uh, that when you find out how the sausage is really made, uh, you are no longer find it appetizing anymore. Would you we'd be talking about things like the file drawer effect or the publication bias or, and things like that, where, where science doesn't quite work, where null results aren't yeah. published yeah. and I, things like that? It's, it's a very much a human, messy endeavor where we do not get things right uh, immediately, maybe in the long run. Yeah, uh, that's how we, I see it. So it's little dips and ups and downs, yeah. but hopefully the progresses. But I, I think I think scientists and skeptics should not be reluctant to admit that we regularly screw up and indeed this is part of the process. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. we're reluctant to do this because sometimes we find ourselves into these in these culture wars and we start thinking of people who disagree with us as uh, political opponents or even enemies rather than people who just happen to disagree with us. Uh, yeah. But I think we're in the long run, we're better served by being quite clear that we're very fallible and we screw up and we will continue to do so in small and sometimes even large ways. That humility. Yeah. So, OK, so as, as, as we sort of start wrapping up, what, what if you had a student come to you or uh, what, in fact, in reality, what, what do you say to students would be the like, for, for the best critical thinking advice that you could give like three three th a couple of things that, that that would be really good advice to your students and therefore for all of us I, in terms of thinking i think that, well i think the main thing they should appreciate is that critical thinking is not primarily something you should apply to the other guy it's our own positions our own if you find that in your an argument, uh, you're getting signals that you're being defensive and something like that, you should pay attention to those signals. Uh, you you want to be you want to be your own best critic. And of course, this is not just a science thing. Uh, anybody in any sort of scholarly endeavor can tell you the same thing. It's good advice. Yeah, I mean, I usually end every one of my videos on remember question everything, particularly yourself. Yeah. You know, because because you know we we so often you know forget to do do the most critical and of analyses to to ourselves. Yeah. So as 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 Paul Schlatter says, you know, critical thinking should be reflected. Absolutely. And, and, and I'm not saying this because of some abstract thing. I, I know because I've embarrassingly screwed up many times myself, and presumably will continue to do so. It's it's part of the yeah. process. Um, so as as we finish, what I usually do for my guests, if you don't mind, is some quick fire questions just to, so people can get to know you. So just uh, really kind of like no thinking answers type thing. So what What's your favorite nonfiction book? Favorite nonfiction book? Probably the latest one that I've read. Uh, but OK, if I want to think about like it to. over the past couple of decades, my favorite nonfiction book, uh, Go to Escher Bach by Douglas Hofstadter. Okay, Hofstadter. So, right, yes. Okay, good. And that, what's that about? Uh, it's about Gödel's theorem. It's yeah. about Escher's art and Bach's music and how they tie to each other with the mathematical concept of a strange loop. I read it while I was in graduate school. It was actually one of the more influential books in that way. It 
helped me think about saying that I don't want to just do science. It's, it's been something of a way of giving myself an excuse to wade into philosophical territory whenever I feel like it. Brilliant. Love it. Uh, favorite, non uh, favorite fiction book? That's got to be uh, The Lord of the Rings. Okay, it's a bit of a cliche, but it's a book that my first acquaintance with it was when my mother read it to me when I was something like age four. As soon as I learned to read after that, I started reading Lord of the Rings over and over and over again. I've probably read it 20 times, and that's not an exaggeration. Wow. Wow. That's impressive. Uh, favorite t movie? Favorite movie? I'm not much of a movie person. So I um, actually TV show? Don't, I don't. Doctor Who. Okay, interesting. Okay, that's cool. Um, uh, if you're just about to get executed for um, believing uh, the wrong scientific theory uh, and you are granted a, a, a last supper, what would be your final meal? Uh, something Mediterranean. Probably a euro. Probably what? A euro. What's a euro? Uh, oh, okay. It's in, in the US, we use the Greek word for euro. Uh, in, the Turkish word for it is donash. Uh, it's the ver meat on a vertical spit. Oh, donna. Sorry, donna. Oh, yeah, donna. So, a donna kebab. Yeah, so, yeah. In, in, in the UK, donna kebab, I mean, it's obviously a Turkish import uh, for mm -hmm. us, but it's really closely associated with getting drunk. Uh, and then going you out on the town, you get drunk and you go to a Donna Kebab van. And so okay. it's actually got got this reputation as like like a low quality uh, thing that you eat when you're drunk, e even though it's got a really good okay. uh, me, heritage and pedigree. So, and I've just been in Turkey and had proper Donna, you know. Yeah, and it's like, this way. It's in Europe, different thing. in Europe, I don't touch your usual Donna, especially anywhere close to Germany. Because the, what the Germans have done out of it, I don't recognize it. You wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to touch it in the UK, no. that's for sure. <laughs> no. Uh, okay, and final question is, um, you are just about to have your face eaten off by a bunch of zombies. So you run down to your bunker that you've handily prepared, uh, and you just have enough time to take, you're not allowed to take family or friends or anything, three people from history or from now, or who? What, which three people would you take to, to live with for a month in a bunker? I'd take my wife and my cats. That's what I do anyway. Uh, you're not allowed to. Uh, I'm not allowed to. That, you're not allowed to. It's got to be three others. Three people from history. Or, or from the now. The, Okay, I have never thought of this, and I would probably end up mutually with a mutual strangulation scenario. Whoever I would end up with a month in, collected in some place. So, uh, hmm, I would take maybe Douglas Hofstadter. Oh, right, okay. Go to Escherbach because he presumably would have a good conversation or two in him. Yep. Uh, I would. I would take uh, a writer that I like, such as Barbara Ehrenreich, maybe. Uh, she's an interesting political writer, and I would get a chance to pick her brains. Brilliant. And uh, maybe uh, I would pick someone uh, who's a science fiction writer. So maybe Anne Leckie. Some of her science fiction has been really interesting for me lately. Like, maybe I'll take her. Yeah. yeah, Science fiction is really interesting because it's like the forefront of philosophical thinking and applying it to human context. I think, so. you know, I should probably read a lot more science fiction myself because it seems that every, every time I, I speak to people about science fiction and talk, talk about, you know, these big ideas, I say, oh, yeah, and that's in that book or this in that book. And like, oh, yeah, yeah, there, there, there's a bit of that. I mean, it gives you an excuse to speculate uh, and see what happens. Yeah. Indeed. Well, look, thank you so much uh, for this conversation. I, I advise everyone to go out and, and grab some of your books. And I think a few people already have. So that's fantastic. Um, uh, uh, do you know if you, if you write a new book or you have a new project on the go, you know, don't be afraid to uh, come back on. And, and we sure. can, uh, As I said, I'm writing. I'm working on one right now and should be finished in a year or two. So. Yeah, brilliant. Let's do it. Um, but in the meantime, you know, thank you so much as ever with everyone. As I always say, you know, question everything, 
particularly yourselves. Oh, yeah. And uh, thank you so much for the lively chat at the side uh, and for any appreciation that you give to the channel. It's hugely, hugely gratefully received. So thank you. And thanks to my guest, uh, Dr. Tanaidis. Really appreciate that.